The message tonight is called Joy in Wilderness. And to start, let's go to Psalm 95, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 95, verses 1 to 3. So the word of God says in Psalm 95, 1 to 3, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with, with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So here the emphasis is on worship, of course, but here in verse number three, the word of God says, for the Lord is a great God and great King above all gods. So we know that there's only one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, but what is referring to here, um, the Lord is a great King above all gods with a small g is talking about, of course, Satan, the God of this world and the fallen angels that are following him. And we need to understand that yes, idolatry, um, you know, the most, the most basic understanding of idolatry is, you know, worshiping a graven image. But we need to understand that even though those graven images have no power, um, there are fallen angels that the Bible calls, you know, gods um, behind all these practices. And, uh, but that's not where we're going into tonight. What, what we're going to focus on here is that as we come to worship the Lord, you know, uh, we ascend into a place in worship, spiritually when we worship God, we ascend into a place where we are set above in the courts of God, above Satan, and above every fallen angel under Satan. So the importance of worship is, is you know, there's no not enough words to, to describe how important it is. And that is part of why Jesus said that in the New Covenant, Jesus said that the Lord is seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth. So, you know, when we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, spirit, you know, meaning inspired by the Holy Ghost, um, inspired songs, you know, and and in truth, which means that like we mean what we say towards the Lord. We don't just sing, you know, oh Jesus, you're my Lord, and then we don't obey him. Um, that's not worshiping in spirit and in truth. Um, so, without going into all the deep intricacies of what worship is um, and obedience is a big part of worship you know here the lord wants us to understand tonight that as we worship him in spirit and in truth as a way of life you know we literally ascend into a spiritual place um, we may not see it in a natural realm but in a spiritual realm as we worship god daily we not only ascend to the throne room of god with the other angels worshiping god in the spirit Okay, um, and that is part of what Christ taught, you know. Um, our Father, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we worship God on earth, we're joining the heavenly choir of angels in heaven. We're not there physically, but we're there in spirit. And that act of worship not only submits us to God's will, but it also fills us with joy because, you know, the word says, sing unto the Lord for joy. But that joy we feel is because of the atmosphere that we're accessing, the heavenly atmosphere at the throne room um, of God in heaven, you know, where the glory of God is and, and, and the jubilation of the angels, you know, we're partaking in that joy. So that's why the Holy Spirit is filling us with joy because we're part participating in that, in that act of obedience to God because he seeks worship in spirit and in truth. But here I want to emphasize that we're ascending to a place above the second heavens okay where where satan dwells and into the third heaven okay so spiritually speaking where we go to a place above satan when we worship god and we especially when when we worship god daily we stay in that place we stay in that place and and and, and that covering and the covering of god is perfected in our, in our lives because that's essentially what uh, what happened with job you know the enemy told God, well, you've had Job all around. I can't even touch him. Well, Job would sacrifice to God every day. You know, like part of sacrifice is worship. So Job was a daily worshiper, was a daily worshiper. And, and, and part of, part of that, um, you know, the consequences of that daily worship to God in spirit and in truth that Job had caused him to be hedged 
about all around. Even his family was hedged about all around. His children and everything he owned was hedged. Satan, Satan had no way in. So we need to understand the importance of worship. It is not something we do once a week, but it is something that we're called to to eventually get to do every day. So we go from glory to glory, and we're not going to see worship as not just one thing, uh, something we do once, you know, uh, when we when we congregate, but it's something we do to not only access the glory of, of heaven's throne while we're on earth, but to also, um, you know, in a way downloaded in our life and everything around us, and it will impact all of our life because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So that, so when we worship God, we're not only ascending there in the spirit, but we're also receiving a download of God's presence invading where we are. And in the same way that Satan cannot abide in heaven, not, not just God alone is the reason why he can't, but also the glory of God just flowing in a place because of worship, he can't abide that. Okay, and that's why Psalm 8 says that out of the mouth of babes, has thou ordained praise to still the enemy and the avenger. So worship is a spiritual weapon. You know, when we worship, we should focus on God. But as we worship properly, it becomes a weapon against the enemy to repel Satan and his demons. Just like, you know, when we spray insecticide, it repels bugs. When we worship that 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 glory of God, of God of the cloud of God repels the enemy's presence. So, you know, um if we want to live you know, uh, a life hedge like Job, hedge like Jesus, okay, where the only way the enemy can touch us is with a special allowance by God, like it happened with Job, like and like it happened with Jesus on the cross, okay, that's the way to do it. We need to become daily worshipers. And this is what this verse says to us, as we did one last time, Psalm 95, verse 1 to 3, it says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So that worship um, keeps us where God is spiritually above all these gods. And like we saw again in the life of Job, if you've, if you've read the story. So let's go to, we're already at Psalm 95, so now we're going to read um, the rest of it, verse 2 to 11. So Psalm 95, 2 to 11, it says, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your father tempted me and proved me and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. So um, I just got inspired with something else above um, what the Lord gave me for the message here. He wants us to, to look at verse... Um, Uh, six, okay, from, from verse six. So he says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden us your heart as in the provocation and as in a day of temptation in the wilderness. So here we need to understand that the worship of God, okay, and we established before obedience is is a, a big part of worship because you know uh if for for example like you know if i tell a family member that i love them but like i never do i never do anything in love that shows my love for them i'm just saying words so 
you know, the follow through when we when we sing songs of praise to God, follow through in the word of God and in what we sing to God, you know, is a big part of worship or else it means nothing. But here we see that also that worship, you know, in the context of it, of obedience as well, precedes the voice of God. So we, we worship God, we obey his word as we study it and read it daily. And as we diligently worship the Lord and diligently obey his word, okay, as the Bible says that God blesses those who diligently seek him, okay, so as we diligently seek the Lord in worship, as, as we diligently obey his word, okay, eventually we're going to hear God's voice and God's voice will never be contrary to his word, okay, so um, just you know, just an, an, a, a quick example here of how God's voice will never be contrary to his word. You know, like, like, like Jesus said, you know, that what God has brought together, let no man separate. So, you know, like if, if like, you know, divorce is rampant in, rampant in the world and rampant in the church. Okay. But, and people, you know, just remarry like it's nothing. But Jesus said, okay, like what God has brought together, let no man separate. So we can't just say we're serving God and we're totally ignoring what God says, you know, and in this particular example, you know, get divorced, marry somebody else while the spouse, the spouse is still alive and just go to church and say, oh, I'm, I'm serving God. So like these things are foolishness. So we need to understand, you know, that worshiping God, you know, um, coupled with obeying his word, will eventually lead to hearing the voice of God with key directive for, for, for our life. You know, things that are not in the Bible, um, you know, like, like, in, like in this example, who to marry? Well, the, the voice of God will lead you, you know, as you, as we worship God and, and, and obey him, he will lead us with, with what we need to hear from his voice, you know, that is uh, tailor-made for, for, for our life. So, so here we see in verse six and seven, that worshiping God properly leads to eventually hearing the voice of God. And he says that, that like when that happens to not harden our hearts, like the children of Israel did in the wilderness, um, because that provokes God. Okay. It, it, it provokes God. And, um, and this scripture about not to harden our hearts to the voice of God is in the provo provocation in the wilderness is also found in a new, in a new Testament. So, you know, uh, Paul, Paul um, spoke about it verbatim in the New Covenant. So we can't say, oh, what the New Covenant? So, you know, like I'm under grace. So whatever I do doesn't matter. No, you know, like Paul said, uh, you know, is the law void because of grace? God forbid. Yet we establish the law. What does that mean? We're not under the penalty of the law because Christ paid the penalty of the law. But we're supposed to follow the word of God, which someone calls calls the law of the Lord and he who meditates in his law day and night, you know, is will be blessed like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So what is this law we meditate in day and night? It's the word of God. Okay, it's the word of God we're still called to obey today. So um without going too far off topic, so here we see again that's read verse six and seven, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, and as in a day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is the people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. So, the rest of God is not just a physical promised land. The rest of God is that peace in our hearts, abundance of peace, that fruit of the spirit that, that is cultivated by a life submitted to the word of God, a life full of the worship of the Lord, a life, you know, guided by God's voice. So, but also here, um, what, uh, like what the Lord wanted to highlight today also concerning the Psalm 95 verse 2 to 11 is that 
the wilderness is a place where God separates us unto himself and for the purpose of killing our dependence on the world systems. In this example of the children of Israel, you know, he, he, he was separating the children of Israel from the kingdom of Egypt and he wanted them to stand on their own two feet in the wilderness, learning under him through Moses and, and the priesthood of Aaron to eventually become, um, you know, a God planted independent nation on, under, under God, under the light of the word of God. So the wilderness is a place where God purposely cuts off our, um, you know, he, he literally takes away from us our, our safety blanket. He takes away from us what is comfortable in any way of dependence, um, you know, in, in any world system. Um, because the love of this, the love of the world is enmity with God. So the wilderness is a place where God literally strips everything that we know of the world and, and has us complete to himself to remold us into the image of, you know, of what his kingdom looks like on the earth for us to carry, to carry that kingdom forward, to be a light to the world. Like Israel was called to be as a nation and like we're called to be through Christ. So we need to we need to view the wilderness as such a place. So when we turn to the Lord, whether it's a physical wilderness or whether it's the wilderness of circumstances in our in, in our lives, we need to turn to the Lord. We need to not, you know, in the case of the children of Israel, some of them were always looking back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was able to give them food, uh, meat, and Pharaoh was able to give them, you know, even though it was scraps, they were you know, some some of the people began to say, let's go back. Let's go back to Egypt. At least there, you know, we had meat. At least there, we had X, Y, Z, you know, and they were looking to Pharaoh. What God wants is to separate us. And, and again, I repeat, whether it's a physical or whether it's a spiritual wilderness, God is desires to separate us from looking at men, okay, to seeking God directly, to have that connection with the Lord. And that's why um, the, the word we just saw, that, that that's why it, it is written, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as you know as in the provocation in the wilderness. Okay. So God wants us to to not depend on 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 you know on people to carry us through to you know for God knows what God wants us. Yes, God uses people and 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 you know God has God has God, God has a kingdom, but God wants us to have each of us, each of his children, that, that connection to him, that is not because I'm, I'm, I'm just getting the, like the parable of, of the, of the wise and, and foolish virgins, you know, with, with, with the lamp, you know, you cannot get your, your, your oil from another believer. You need to get your oil directly from the source. Okay. So we need to understand that no, like no one can fill our lamp with oil, all that we can do at, at, at our best, you know, is, is to be in some way or another point people to the source, but we cannot carry, none of us can carry anybody else, you know, to God. We need to, 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 to heed, heed the word of God and go to the source, get our oil, because that is the only thing that God will allow. God will never allow, you know, us to get our like our our, our oil away from uh, you know that is not from from the, from His source. And if we do, then then that is not that is not the, the, the true oil of the Holy Spirit, and it will not sustain us. And and that's how we know it's not of God. So. Jesus said to his disciples, which means people who were, you know, following him under his teachings, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So God's voice, as we obey his voice, as, as the disciples followed and obeyed Jesus, okay, as we obey God's voice, 
you know, and again, his force is always biblical, com biblically compatible, never goes against against it. As we obey God's voice, we will eventually, it will eventually lead us, you know, to, to, to a dry place. And like I just said, that, that dry place is a, is a place of testing. God took Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. Okay. God, um, you know, whether it's the children of Israel going, to, going to the wilderness before fulfilling their destiny as becoming the kingdom of God, um, you know, the planting, the vine of God, the planting of his vine in a holy land, or whether it's the son of God, Jesus, our savior, you know, who was taken through the wilderness before fulfilling his destiny to, to, to die, to die, to be the perfect sacrifice, the lamb of God, who took away our sins and died for us and rose up again, conquered death, took the, took, took the keys of hell and death and resurrected and ascended and was glorified and forever will rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to understand that just like Israel as a whole or Christ, we're not above above our master Jesus to avoid a wilderness to eventually reach, you know, the place where God wants us to reach. Whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, that's that what I'm what I'm saying is that if we're if we genuinely follow the Lord, we will go through a wilderness. And in that wilderness, Okay, Israel was to obey God's voice and follow it, and Christ was to obey God's voice and follow it, and he defeated the enemy's temptation with the word of God. So it is the word of God that will that will carry us in the wilderness, and it is, it is the word of God that will make us emerge out of that wilderness ready for God's purposes. So we need to understand that we need to go to the source directly and only that will carry us and just because we go through hard times it doesn't mean that god's principles change god is always there god is close to the brokenhearted okay but we need to be careful because the bible says that that you know that god is a father and 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 god chastises those whom he loves so we need to understand that God is close to the brokenhearted, but we need to make sure that where we find ourselves, it is not God's chastisement, but, you know, it, 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 it is better to be in a wilderness because of, you know, a testing of God before the next phase than to be in a place where we're being chastised of God. But the good news in both cases is that God, you know, is, you know, God is near, and as soon as we make up our mind to take his hand, obey him, and walk with him, he'll take us out of either one of those situations. So that is the good news about, about either case. But we need to ask ourselves, do I find myself in the place because the, that, because the, the, the enemy is testing my resolve with God? Or do I find myself in the place because, you know, I've chosen to simply, like, you know, do my own thing so we, we need to rightly assess our situations so we can understand how to properly um you know take actions to get out of it with the word and wisdom of god so let's go now to exodus chapter 7 verse 15 to 16. exodus chapter 7 verse 15 to 16. Okay, Exodus seven fifteen to sixteen. So the word of God says, "Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come, and the rod which was turned to a serpent thou shalt take in thine hand." And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. 
So what God wants us to highlight today here in verse 16, he said, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto thee saying, let my people go that they may serve me in a wilderness. He didn't say, let my people go so God can supernaturally transport us in the Holy Land and kill all the giants, but you know, himself for us and give us manna for all eternity. And we never have to lift a finger to do anything. No, God said, you know, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto thee saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. The first stage of serving God will always you know, like the, like the, the the word of God said in the word of God says in New Covenant, if you're faithful in the few, who's faithful in the few is also faithful in much. God will always start us in the place where He is the only way that we're going to go forward. Okay, the enemy always has a counterfeit, you know, and a bribe, and 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 a way to do things. But the end of those ways is death and perdition. And misery but if we do things god's way we will always start small we will always start you know in what seems to those who are not uh, who don't have the, the knowledge of god it will seem like a gloomy miserable place and who would want to be there okay like like atheists you know often think when they when they look at christians and the way they lead their lives but that's where god will always take us to a place to begin where we need to fully depend on him, not only to be, you know, uh, completely stripped of the of the world, the way the, the way of the way that the world thinks, you know, that's, that's that's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So God needs to remove our pride. God needs to remove, you know, like this this lustful desires that we may have, which is not just you know sexual, um, you know, it, it, it it's also covetousness. Okay, so he needs to, to remove the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So the wilderness is designed to do this. And the wilderness is a place of testing because God will always test the people that he uses to serve him. And Moses said to Pharaoh that God sent him to tell him, let my people go that he may serve me in the wilderness. So understand that if you want to serve God, the wilderness is unavoidable and if we're not ready to go through a wilderness for for, for 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 the sake of the Lord and His purposes for us, we simply kid ourselves and we will lock ourselves in a fantasy uh, in a fantasy walk of walk of, of God which doesn't exist, uh, which is all about you know being 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 pampered, being fed what the Bible says doctrines of devils. And seducing spirits to have our ear ears tickled to to never to to simply just have 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 a Christian club. That's not what that's not what the word of God is about. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. So we need to understand that if we want to walk with the Lord, we, we gotta we gotta all be servants. And if we're gonna serve the Lord like Jesus and like the children of Israel, we will have to go through a wilderness. Okay, and we have to endure. We have to lean on the word of God to get through that wilderness. And then the Lord will trust us to bring us into a place of, of, of plenty, a place of rest, a place of, of you know, of, um, you know, which simply, simply put, like, you know, which is the rest of God, a place where we are full, you know, not of, not of like money, because the Bible says that, that, you know, from 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 those who think that that uh, that godliness is gain, turn from such people. Okay, so you know we really need to break down a lot of what has been taught to us. Okay, with the word of God, which is the only way to to break out of that matrix, and go back to what God is really talking about. God said, you know, that He's the, the word of God says that God is glorified in that we bear much fruit. Okay, so. Like in closing, let's go to let's go to Galatians five, and see what God is looking from us. Galatians five, 
beginning at verse 22. This is what God is looking for, like to, to mold in us. And when these things abound, okay, it's called virtue. Okay, and it is that virtue by which Christ was able to heal people. Because when, when, the woman, when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, and he said, who touched me because I perceive virtue has come out of me. Okay, well, this is, this is the virtue he was talking about. This is, this is that spiritual power or that virtue that came out of Christ to do miracles. And, that, and it, it is the same river of the Holy Spirit that God desires to make flow from our belly unto eternal life. So we can walk in that same power and virtue. This is what it is. Galatians 5. Okay, this is the fruit of the Spirit, which means this is the river of the Spirit that God wants to make run in our belly. Okay, so Galatians 5, uh, 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, okay, so we see this, this is the, the, the river of the Spirit here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Okay, I notice your long suffering. Nobody, nobody wants to talk about the fruit of long suffering. Long suffering is something that God will, will, mold in us through the wilderness. So we need to understand that always running from, from uh, truth and difficulties and, and things we need to face with the Word of God, which is the mirror. We can't just look at a mirror, you know. We can't just look at a mirror. Our hair is all messed up. You know, we, like we, we have dry drool on our face from sleeping at night and then we just go outside. None of us would do that. But unfortunately, we do it all the time with the Word of God. We, we, we read the Word of God. We see what needs to change, but we ignore it and just keep going. And then we wonder why God doesn't take us seriously to, 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 to bless us to the next level that we think we should have. Well, you know, if any of us would see a police officer pull us over, you know, his hair is all uncombed, he's full of dry drool like on his face from sleeping, you know, we, we would not take him seriously either. So in the same way, why would God give us all those things that we, that we believe we should have if we never care to look in the mirror of his word and fix what needs to be fixed in our lives? This is what makes people, you know, turn in circle for 40 years in the wilderness, grieving the Holy Spirit, and never going anywhere. We need to snap out of it. We need to look in the mirror of the word. We need to look at what the word says that God wants us to have and to do and 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 throw away everything we've learned that doesn't match those things. And we need to get real with ourselves and real with God and you know, do things God's way to get the promises of God. Okay, the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus, not not in our own way of doing things. They're in Christ Jesus. So that's the message today, joy in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place to desire to be in because that's where God is really shaping us to stand on our own two feet through his Holy Spirit, of course, okay, for the purposes we were created to do for him. So God didn't say to, you know, tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may do whatever they want to do you know, like in, 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 in an amazing land. He said that he may serve me in the wilderness. So he begins in the wilderness to serve God. He begins in a dry place. And if we're faithful, we enter, we enter that rest. So this is what the message is about tonight. Joy in the wilderness. So we, we shouldn't run from the wilderness. We should embrace it. Because this is where God is molding us to become a true light. Just like the children of Israel and just like Christ. This is what is needed for us to, to, to truly become a light in, to, in, in this world. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.